Okay. Um, so welcome back, everybody in the room, online. Um, so as promised, this afternoon will be dedicated to uh, mostly, I mean, we will go back and forth a little bit, because it's, but to geospatial impact evaluation. Um, and the, the afternoon will be a, a series of lightning talks. We have divided a little bit by, by domain. So the first um, session will be mostly around climate initiatives. And the, the second part will expand that scope uh, to urban development as well as, as conflict uh, issues. Um, and to help us facilitate this uh, afternoon, we have here uh, Alex Chunet, who is um, um, at the European Space Agency, representative to the World Bank, so he embodies a partnership, which is, which is great. Um, and he's hosted at the GFDRR, where he uh, coordinates really all of these collaborative activities under the uh, ESA partnership. Uh, so Alex will be giving us a bit of a, of a, of a setting the stage presentation um, and then he will help us uh, chair the session with, with all of the other lightning talks. So Alex, over to you. No? Okay, now that works. Uh, so thanks a lot for the invitation. Pleasure to be here today with you. And I'll start with, uh, as I still mentioned, a very quick and overview just to mention remote sensing and the potential of remote sensing for monitoring and impact evaluation, and then I'll hand over to the different uh, discussions on specific use cases and applications. So first of all, starting with the beginning, what is remote sensing? So remote sensing is not only satellites and drones that capture imagery and, and for us to visualize this imagery, it's also about analyzing this imagery, classifying it potentially by crossing both drone imagery and satellite imagery and scaling up the analysis. And it's also about the software and the people that are behind this, right? We, you need people that have the skills to operate uh, and to make those analysis. You need potentially software. The software can be uh, open source or it can be proprietary software. There is, there is a lot of different modalities that will have a consequence or, or an implication on how you can integrate those technologies and how you can potentially use them for monitoring and impact evaluation. Something that's very important in terms of those technologies is that there is a huge amount of data available. And this data is often full, free, and open. Here I'm taking, of course, the example of the Copernicus program. So through the Copernicus program only, which is the program basically that is pushed by the European Commission with the European Space Agency, there is 300 terabytes that are being delivered to society daily. So we're talking about a huge amount of data that is probably underused right now, right? So we need to see how we can capitalize on this data and push it forward in order to build monitoring and impact evaluation uh, systems or applications that, that really take advantage of this potential. To put it in very concrete terms, I guess, um, and, and for you to visualize it, this is what it looks like. This example is the example of Sentinel-2. So Sentinel-2 essentially is an optical um, satellite, a constellation of satellite sensors that covers the whole globe every five days at 10 meters resolution. So this is the type of imagery and data we're talking about, which implies frequency and global coverage. So in terms of the uh, the use of this data, what's also important to note, which I was referring to at the beginning, is that we're not only talking about um, small animation here. Just a second, I'm trying to, okay. The animation is not working, so I'll just have to comment it. Sorry about that. So essentially, this animation is supposed to show you how um, we're not only talking about imagery here, but we're talking actually about how you can extract indicators from this imagery, right? It's not only about visualizing a picture. It's about how you can extract indicators such as uh, built up or gas concentration or chlorophyll or uh, basically f flood extent, water, evapotranspiration. So there is much more to the imagery than we first see. There is a lot of indicators that can be extracted from it that are outside of the spectrum of uh, the human eye, in a sense. So regarding the value of Earth observation data, as I was mentioning, it's, for, first of all, affordability, because a lot of its data is available, available full, free, and open. It's also about coverage, often a global coverage. It's about frequency, as I was mentioning, the Sentinel-2 constellation. There's a full coverage of the whole globe every five days. Anonymity, because we do not rely on uh, personal data. Uh, objectivity, because the sensors are at the low uh, 
low, basically, there is a low risk of bias, essentially, for these sensors. And uh, then continuity, because those programs, as I was mentioning, the Copernicus programs, all the constellations that are managed by the US, are uh, multi-decades efforts, right, that will be continued in the future. So these are all potentially the advantages that we're contemplating here or regarding the use of this imagery. Of course, I'm, I'm not necessarily, some of those advantages differ depending on the exact source you'll be using. There's a lot of commercial imagery out there that is available and it doesn't necessarily cover the whole globe, doesn't necessarily have the same frequency. So there's a whole panel of different solutions, but generally speaking, when we talk about Earth observation, we're talking about those advantages. Then there are specific constraints, of course, and obstacles. Uh, first, the limited thematic scope. The reality is that Earth observation and satellite imagery cannot be used for any topic out there, right? There is uh, certain variables potentially related to poverty or social development that cannot be captured with this type of imagery. Another issue is that often we do not understand or, or people think that the imagery alone uh, will, will be able to use it and basically extract uh, all its potential only by using the imagery without in situ data. The reality is that in order to extract the most uh, value of this imagery and this data, we really need often to combine it with in situ data, not only for calibration, but also potentially for training, to train an algorithm that will then be able to classify uh, the data. And then the two other quick um, obstacles and potential binding constraints I wanted to mention here are the necessity for complementary skills and also sometimes unadapted internal processes. So first, of course, you need people that can analyze this imagery, either internally or externally, and then you need the right processes to, to use this, this imagery. There are some institutions that have the right people with the right skills and the right data, but when it's not integrated in the systems in the right way, it cannot be used properly. And I guess we'll also have some examples on this. Um, just let me know when I get close to time. Uh, I wouldn't want to, to go over too much. Um, Regarding the examples, I, I wanted to give very quick examples out there, again, to set the stage. This example is one that we've been implementing recently in Pakistan. So essentially, it's about small monitoring small-scale uh, infrastructure in Pakistan, just as uh, schools or, or wells. And here we're using very high-resolution satellite imagery to monitor construction. And what's interesting is not necessarily the pictures you're seeing here, but it's how then it's been used and integrated. So essentially... Yeah, I, th I think we are having issues with the animations, unfortunately. I, I thought this was going to run smooth, but I'm sorry about that. I'll, I'll try, potentially I'll try to fix them and then we'll come back to, to them later. So on this slide, uh, what you're seeing here, and it's supposed to be animated, is a decision support system. So it's a platform that we've built where we have the location of the different projects, and then you can overlay this with changes in land use, changes in land cover, and all the data, not only the locations of those uh, projects, but also the very high resolution satellite imagery before and after and the changes in land use and land cover are concentrated on one platform, which allows basically to do the monitoring and to kind of uh, pilot the project itself, right? It's, it's live monitoring and evaluation in order to pilot the project and, and kind of strategize in a sense, right? So it's live monitoring based on Earth's observation. Uh, then when it comes to impact evaluation specifically, as I was referring just before to, to monitoring mainly, there are different advantages and potential benefits that are specific to impact ev evaluation that we should mention. First, the increase in, num or in the number or quality of, of measured outcomes. As I was mentioning, satellite Im imagery can be used to expand kind of the indicators that you will be able to monitor. I don't know, for a typical example is you could monitor the type of roofs um, in, in, in slums in, in a city, uh, which can add potentially to the statistical, statistical analysis you're implementing. Then there is, of course, the possibility to extend temporal or geographical coverage. Looking back in time, some constellations were uh, basically sent in space decades ago. This imagery is still available out there. We can still come back to it. The Sentinel imagery uh, started being collected in 2016, and we can basically use it uh, and, and come back to 2016, 2017 to see what's been happening, not only in the AOI area of interest, but also at a larger scale. And then by expanding, essentially, uh, the population that we're looking at, there is the possibility to increase the statistical power of the analysis. Now, of course, you need to take into account the potential uncertainty by adding those variables, and, and it's kind of always of a trade-off. But let's say that this is a potential benefit. Uh, for impact evaluation regarding the use of Earth's observation. Last three slides, uh, three or four slides I wanted to have are on specific examples. So one basic example, 
we often think about these nighttime lights, how this correlates potentially with uh, GDP. There is a lot of caveats to that that we need to take into account. I won't enter into them right now, but it's one of the typical and basic examples that we've seen arising in the last uh, uh, one or two decades. Another example is the use of uh, vegetation indices, NDVI uh, or NDWI actually, um, which can be used to monitor potentially increases in agriculture productivity or impacts of, of, of droughts in a sense. All those can easily be used for impact evaluation exercises. So those are, the, I would say, also with deforestation, two of the basic examples. And some more innovative examples uh, can also be found. And, and those are things I'm really excited about. Typically, this one, uh, this is GHG SAT data. This data monitors uh, methane concentration at 30 meters resolution. So this data we've provided through a specific program of ESA to DIME, so the impact evaluation uh, unit at the World Bank, in order to track methane uh, emissions from landfills in West Africa and how certain measures were uh, managing to potentially reduce those emissions, right? So this is a quite ex exciting and innovative application. Another one potentially is uh, land surface temperature. Uh, land surface temperature, and, and especially through new uh, constellations that will be sent into space soon, how we can monitor the, the temperature within the city at a, also a very small scale. There are sensors out there that can capture it at a, at a scale of up to, I think, 10 to 15 meters, and how potentially green spaces can lower the temperature and, and, and kind of mitigate the urban heat islands effects, right? The, the, those are the, the type of applications that I think are going to be, going to be increasing um, in scale in, in the next few years. Now, the, the last thing I wanted to quickly mention is that there are a lot of new constellations that will be sent in space. There's the biomass constellation that will really solve the issue of saturation regarding biomass that we're currently ex experiencing when we try to measure it from space, and other uh, constellations that will be uh, launched in the next few years, such as LSTM, which is actually Land Surface Temperature, or CHIME, which is hyperspectral. All of this will offer a lot of opportunities uh, to monitor, better monitor with more certainty, more granularity, and, and with an expanded spectrum, uh, some of the indicators I, I was mentioning. Great, so that's what I wanted to uh, quickly mention today. Um, now, off to the, the real example and concrete examples with, uh, with different speakers that we have at the table today, and, and thanks a lot to them for participating in this um, in this event, and we'll start with um, the great presentation of Masha Rosenbach, who is an evaluator and team leader at the German Institute for Development Evaluation, and that will talk uh, about irrigations, uh, basically strengthening um, irrigation in Mali, essentially. So over to you, Masha. Can you hear us and can we hear you? Thank you, Alex. Great. Can you hear me all right? Yeah. Yes, we can. Okay. Okay, thank you very much. Yeah, uh, first of all, thank you for have, making it possible for people like me and others to um, participate at this great event, even though we were unable to travel. Um, what I'll be presenting is a study in which we ask whether irrigation strengthens climate resilience. It's a geospatial impact evaluation of irrigation interventions in Mali. This is joint work with... Um, a colleague from Deval, which is the same institute as where um, Kai works, a colleague from the University of Bamako in Mali, and colleagues from 8Data. And I'm really happy that some of them are actually in the room, Kunva and, and Rachel. And um, if you have questions later on, I'm sure that all three of us can be taking um, questions. Um, I should mention that Kai also supported the project at some point. Um, let me now um, come to t talking a little bit about the motivation for the study on the next couple of slides. We can even move one slide. Yes, thank you. So the background. Sorry, I was too quick. Can we see the slide before? Thanks. So the background to the study um, was that agriculture in Mali is a really important source of food security for income and for the country's GDP. Um, agriculture is still dominated by uh, rain-fed agriculture, yet rain has become more and more unpredictable and is projected to become even more erratic due to climate change. At the same time, um, 
temperatures are expected to rise due to climate change in all of the Sahel and uh, so also in Mali. Um, and this will actually increase the amount of water needed to keep the agriculture production at the level where it is, where, which already, um, by the way, is too low to, to feed um, vulnerable populations, um, particularly in the north of Mali, and to generate income beyond uh, food security. So this is why um, German Development Corporation has been financing irrigation infrastructure over a long time now, for almost 20 years. Actually, um, this is mostly these these um, projects I'll be talking about uh, have mostly been implemented by, by the KFW. We have at least one co colleague, uh, Melvin, also um, from the KFW here. I know he knows the study very well already. Um, and um, I should also mention that the GIZ, which is the Technical uh, Development Corporation in Germany, also supported those projects. Um, <clears throat> So let me just say a couple of things about these interventions. They're relatively straightforward. So it's irrigation infrastructure for agriculture, where rainwater is stored and river water is used, water by, uh, of the Niger River, to irrigate nearby fields when it is needed and not dependent on rainfall. In the next slides, I want to explain how we went about assessing the effects of these interventions. As many evaluations, we began by reconstructing a theory of change from project documentation, and we also used a lot of research on impacts of irrigation, so literature. Once uh, we sketched this theory, we devised proxies for different dimensions of resilience to measure effects at the impact level. We had a three-dimensional understanding of resilience. One was uh, economic resilience, measured through um, agricultural production, food security, and income. Then social resilience, where we studied um, effects on women empowerment and peace and conflict, so conflict intensity, essentially. And lastly, um, also environmental resilience, where we looked at wind erosion, soil moisture, and biodiversity. On the next slides, I want to um, say a little bit more about how we actually went about measuring these um, dimensions of resilience. On the next slide, um, sorry, the slide before that, you'll see um, the data sources that we used. Can we please go back one slide? So, sorry, it seems like the slide on data sources is not showing, which would be two slides after this one. But I'll just keep on talking about it. So we used project data. These were probably the most essential data and the most hard to get. So this is um, geocoded polygon data of the sites. Um, we use climate variables to uh, account for climatic differences between um, project sites, but also across time in, in the same sites. We use Landsat data, survey data, conflict event data, and high resolution data. Um, now, how did we um, try to measure causal effects with these data now? We used a quasi-experimental design for the analysis that leverages the fact that those interventions followed a staggered rollout, So, which means that not all of these um, sites or fields started being irrigated at the same time, but more and more sort of sites um, sort of, um, it, there were more and more fields that were being, uh, where the infrastructure was set up across these years. Um, it's uh, essentially an event study design where the underlying model is a two-way fixed effect model that adjusts for polygon specific differences in all kinds of outcomes that we study, such as, for example, NDVI that was just mentioned by Alex, which we use as a proxy for agricultural productivity. Um, we also um, account for year and season specific um, differences, which accounts for variation across all irrigated polygons. As some sites are more productive, some seasons are better than others. And this model also allows us to focus on what happens within a polygon after introduction of irrigation. 
Um, this type of two-way fixed effects model also accounts for time variation bias by including only polygons in the comparison at each point in time that have not yet been treated at this point in time. But what might be more interesting even than the methodology, I guess, are the findings. Um, you can see in this graph, this shows probably our most important outcome, which is the NDVI, and which is a proxy for um, yields or agricultural productivity. What you see in the in the red in the left graph, um, graphed in red, is that the pre-trend in NDVI was very stable, which is good, which means that the control and the treatment sites are similar pre-treatment, so before the intervention begins. And then we see um, a pretty uh, steep increase of um, agricultural productivity after treatment starts. And it's not just an, a brief increase after treatment, but a quite significant and sustained improvement in NDVI over, over a long time span, longer than um, more than 10 years. These effects uh, last for more than 10 years. And it's also quite substantial. So um, through, this, um, through this intervention, yields were increased by about one third. We, um, as you can guess from all these data sources that I listed, we also studied lots of other outcomes. For example, on the next slide, um, child health and nutrition. Um, Rachel is really the expert on this. Um, the, our results showed signs of improvements in the nearest two bands, which means that um, the uh, health of, of children right um, at the project sites, it really um, became um, showed important improvements. Um, however, these effects um, became a little different in, um, uh, in, in, in sites that were far, uh, were in areas that were farther away from these sites. Can we please move uh, one slide? Yep. So this was the slide I was talking about. Now we can uh, go further to um, our conflict effects. So um, here we also saw some, let's say, normatively positive effects of the interventions. Conflict intensity at the project sites went down as a uh, consequence of um, the interventions. However, I must also say that um, we have some um, a little bit more troubling findings as well because it looks as if um, conflict intensity didn't go down overall, but it actually relocated to areas that were farther away from those sites. Next, um, and this is the last finding I wanted to share with you, is on, we also studied ecological resilience, as you saw. And we, we did this, and Kun was the expert on this. He, he did these analysis by um, explore, exploring um, very high resolution imagery. First, we assessed land use changes and identified increases in crop diversity following the implementation of irrigation. This was interesting to see whether there are some, whether there are maybe um, also non-intended negative effects of these sites, but also, first of all, this served us to confirm that um, project sites actually reflected landscapes that were initially classified as grassland, bare earth, or shrubs, and that these were actually converted into farmland, which, you know, increased the plausibility in our findings on uh, agricultural um, productivity and the increases we saw there. Um, the visual analysis also suggested um, increasing crop diversity after the irrigation interventions began. But, but as I said, we also use this um, type of analysis to see whether there might be some, you know, negative um, impacts on of these interventions on the um, ecology. What we saw were um, some instances of algal booms and of soil erosion. However, here it remained a little unclear if this was due to access irrigation or to the proximity of the Niger River of these sites. Let me finish with some takeaways from the study. So um, this is on the last slide. 
pump-based irrigation had long-lasting positive effects on agricultural production and child health. Um, I should maybe say that this um, this is part of a, a larger evaluation that Deva did. It was a super long and big evaluation, which went for more than four years, where we studied um, adaptation to climate change and how um, what role um, German Development Corporation played here in sort of adaptation to climate change in its partner countries. So this has been published in several ways. The study as, um, you know, a small part in, a, in an evaluation report. We also have a discussion paper. And now um, this has been published as is in a much smaller, you know, a, a much shorter version of this has been published now at PNAS Nexus, so as a scientific paper. So this is um, open access if you're interested in, in reading this. Um, I'll be happy to post the link. Um, but maybe what's more um, more interesting for the crowd here in the room and virtually is what can we learn from this from using this methodology in other contexts. So um, we think that geospatial impact evaluations are a suitable approach if an intervention has a geospatial dimension. Um, however, it requires high quality data on site locations and boundaries. It's also a very suitable approach if access to the field is limited. So we were able to do a quasi-experimental causal analysis without having to run RCTs um, in the middle of a pandemic and in a conflict-ridden area where we would not have been able to collect data on the ground. And the beauty of it is also that, and I think several panelists have mentioned this already, geospatial impact evaluation evaluations are possible even if baseline data is absent because you just reconstruct these data retrospectively, which we did. Um, but I should also, um, it should not go uh, unmentioned that final sample selection and the compiling of polygon data is time intense. So that was the biggest challenge here. Um, referring to sort of the question that you posed in the beginning of, of our symposium of this day, what, were challenge, what are challenges? I think challenges or the most important one that we faced was um, to get high quality um, polygon data. And um, maybe just an interesting anecdote to this. I'm uh, by original training, I'm a conflict researcher, and normally data from conflict zones is all it's relatively, you know, bad and scarce and is usually worse than from peaceful areas and countries. However, in this case, because the KFW and its project partners had started monitoring um, those um, their projects uh, remotely through a drone imagery, they actually had better quality data of those polygons where the conflict was more intense than of southern Mali, um, where monitoring was still done by the um, project staff itself. Um, what's the way forward? Uh, what do we think? So we think that continued monitoring of projects with geodata would really be great and would, you know, increase even sort of the possibilities that we see in using these kinds of um, methodologies and um, building up repositories of evaluations using geodata is also something I think that would be great and that we could all sort of learn from when um, we plan next evaluations. Thank you so much. Thank you, Masha. Thank you very much. Um, Great. Th thanks a lot, Masha, uh, for this super interesting work you guys did in Mali. So, of course, if there are any questions or comments, we'll be happy to take them in, in the last part of the, of the session. Now we're going to continue with Ingrid from uh, AFD who is actually an impact evaluation officer at the French development agency, the Agence Française de Développement, and that will also do a presentation uh, together with Melvin Wong, portfolio manager at uh, KFV, uh, in the evaluation unit of, actually of KFV. They'll do a, a presentation on con conservation, is eventually basically uh, evaluating conservation efforts um, and the, the link to forest cover loss essentially for both the KFW and AFD portfolio, so over to you. Thank you. Uh, can you hear us? Yes. 
Okay, thank you. Thanks, Alex, for introduction. Yes, um, I'm Melvin from KFW Evaluation Department, and we're going to present the geospatial impact evaluation of KFW and AFD's conservation portfolio on forest cover loss. Um, it is the work that we have also started like four years ago uh, in KFW to assess um, what the impact is, um, causal impact is of um, area-based conservation on forest cover loss. And um, because we have um, such a close relationship with AFD within the MEDME framework, as also highlighted by Claire uh, this morning, um, we shared our knowledge as well with um, AFD and um, hence we have this common presentation here and hand over to Ingrid with the same slide. Thank you, Melvin, and good afternoon, everybody. And do you hear me well? Yes. Okay. Yes, very well. So, uh, okay, thank you. And so we can start uh, this presentation explaining why are we analyzing protected areas? Because biodiversity conservation represents a priority for both the <laughs> French and German development cooperations. And Germany alone accounts for about 25% of worldwide ODA and supports through the KFW 900 protected areas worldwide, mainly in Latin America and Africa. In AFT, although we don't have a precise number of the total portfolio, we supported much more than 250 protected areas in the last 20 years, in at least 45 countries and mainly in Africa. So given this huge uh, engagement on biodiversity conservation, it is crucial to measure whether the projects are effective or not. And the main objective of uh, terrestrial uh, protected areas is to reduce or stop deforestation. But the effectiveness of these conservation programs remains hard to quantify. And often, operative use only monitoring data on forest cover loss, for, for instance, and which may lead to wrong conclusions about effectiveness and um, a loss of trust on forest conservation. And this means lower investments. So for instance, you can see in the graph on the right down and you see the evolution of forest cover loss in a defined area that in a point of time and that you can see in the vertical red line became a protected area and we can observe an increase of uh, cover loss after the programming implementation so does that mean that the conservation program was not effective or maybe it was an area that was under a big uh, agricultural exp expansion pressure, and that's why it was uh, decided to be protected. So there was a high likelihood that forest cover loss increases in this zone anyhow, with uh, or without a protected area. So the right question is not how does forest cover change after the conservation program, but what will be the forest cover in this new protected area in the absence of the conservation program. So, which means in other words, that um, what is the impact of the program? And that is the, the research uh, question here. And to our answer to this question, um, we need data on, uh, please next uh, slide, next. And we need data on the location of the protected areas extracted from WDPA database on the indicator of interest here. And we use uh, forest cover loss from forest cover watch and other geolocated uh, cover levels related to conservation. And I do an advertising here. The data on forest cover and cover levels were extracted and pre-managed by the MAPMI Biodiversity Package in R. And uh, you see on the right, and the KFW and AFT locations of uh, the protected area studied in Latin America and Africa, respectively, with a concentration in the Amazonian basin for, for KFW and in the Congo basin for AFT. 
And so now I let um, Melvin explain to you the methods uh, we employed to answer the impact question. Thank you. So we can go to the next method slide um, because what we try to do is we try to figure out what is um, the, the difference between uh, a protected area and the, the forest cover area there uh, compared to um, the situation if there was no financing. Um, so for KFW, it would be the financing of existing protected areas. For AFD, it would also be the generation of new protected areas. We encompass this as um, kind of um, conservation project. So um, in order to find um, a suitable control, um, we divide the world into squares. Um, so we have squares of one to 15 square kilometers, um, varying by country size for AFD. Uh, for KFW, we fix it to five square kilometers. And then once we divided the country uh, in, in different cells, we can identify treatment cells, which are the um, areas within the protected area. And then any other area is a candidate control cell. Um, because these treatment cells, they, they differ um, from, from particular forests. So what we would like to have is um, to have a control that resembles pretty much the same characteristics um, as the treatment cells. And you can see the list here. Um, so we would like to have the control cells to have the same forest area at the project start, right? Um, to have like equal um, starting ground. We also would like to have the same forest loss dynamic um, from the beginning of the data set, which is 2001, up to the project start. They should also have a similar travel time to the next city above 5,000 people. Um, because these represent also um, forest loss pressure. Um, clay content is arguably um, a very, very rough indicator of culture suitability. And the terrain ruggedness and elevation above sea level um, accounts or should account for the accessibility of harvester machines, um, which makes it very efficient to cut wood in forests. So they should also be very similar between treatment and control cells. Naturally, we also like to make comparisons only within the same country, right? So we use a course and exact matching approach. Maybe you can use the next slide, please. And once we have done that, we see um, this um, kind of distribution, right? The green area is uh, the controls sorry, the treatment cells, the protected area basically, and all the blue dots are the selected uh, control cells, right? Um, these are the ones that we find suitable. If we go to the next slide with the histogram, yes, density plot, sorry, um, you can see how it looks like. So before we did this course and exact matching, we have, um, the, they have very different characteristics. Here you can see the distribution of travel time between um, the candidate control cells in this reddish color and the distribution of travel time of um, treatment cells, of forest areas and protected areas. And we can see here very big differences. Um, so on average, protected areas are further away from cities, right? It's not so surprising. After we did this matching, we can see that the distribution of the travel time is equalized, uh, all nearly identical um, between the treatment and control cells. So we did this for every other characteristics and um, we, we have like metrics to say um, that this is good enough uh, to fit into our statistical analysis. Right. So um, if you go to the next slide, please, I can show you the results for KFW. Um, thank you. So this one would also be um, some kind of before and after comparison here. Um, before the matching, we can see that um, in green, you have 
the forest cover area, not loss, it's the area for each year of the treatment cells in the green line. And the red lines are the candidate control cells. And you can see two things. First of all, the differences are in absolute terms is, are quite big. Um, you have way more forest cover in protected areas than in, um, in any other cell, which also includes cities. Right? And you also have different, a different trend in, um, in, in forest cover area. So you have a stronger decrease in, um, in, in forest area of non protected areas. After this matching, um, you see that um, the differences before the dashed line, dashed line is the start of financing of KFW's um, money into these protected areas. Before the financing, the differences, um, the absolute differences are neutralized. If you go to the next graph, you can see the same graph, but with the higher Y scale resolution. It's just, it's just the same, just a different resolution of the Y scale. And you can see that there's a parallel trend even before the treatment. And afterwards, you can see like a divergence of um, the forest cover area. Right. Next slide, please. Here you can see the area that we want. To, sorry. Uh, yes. The, 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 the uh, yellow area is the one area that we would like to estimate um, in our, um, as our coefficients. And we do this kind of analysis for each protected area that has been financed, and we, we, may, we have coefficients to show that. So we do this for our about 400 um, protected areas. If you go to the next slide, um, you can see a coefficient plot here with each blue dot. It looks like a line, but it's actually it's a dot with very many, many, many different um, coefficients uh, of each protected area. Um, and then the red lines are the confidence interval. On average, what you see here is they are on the right hand side of the zero line. That means um, cells, uh, sorry, that means protected areas, they have on average a higher forest cover after financing than comparable um, comparable non protected areas. Right? Um, you can also see that there are some negative um, and significant results as well, meaning that in these protected areas you have lower forest cover than comparable um, um, forest areas after financing. So, and these are the ones that they're particularly interested and in, interesting uh, for learning, right? But on average, we can see a conservation effect, um, which is kind of um, from a from a development bank perspective, um, nice nice to see, right? So um, let's move on to the AFD results here. Thank you. Uh, next slide, please. So before I start uh, with the um, results, please take into account that uh, this is still a very preliminary analysis with a preliminary database also. And so compared to what uh, Melvin presented on the KFWU, this database is very restricted because of two issues that we have. And we still need to spend more time on identifying all the conservation projects uh, internally. So this database is not exhaustive. And but also, and because um, from the 150 protected areas identified, only half of them were Rio geo referenced in the WDPA database. And what led us and with uh, 72 protected, protected areas. And I don't know if it is uh, specific to AFT and or for Africa, but uh, a lot of protected areas in the sample, sample don't have a legal status yet. And thus, they are not published in the WDPA database. So that is um, one of the, a big issue for, for us. 
So, and from this set of uh, 72 areas, only 23 were non-marines and with an area higher than one square uh, kilometer, which is the size limit that we considered. And from these 23 areas, only 15 met the statistical conditions to be analyzed with the match matching method used. So at the end, we assess uh, the impact of 15 protected areas. And next slide, please. So here I show you an example of a protected area in Congo and where it can be seen in the figure on the left, the evolution of the forest cover through time for the control cells in red and the treatment cells in blue and a black vertical line for the funding year and yellow for the program implementation year. And you can see that uh, two years after, um, after the protected area was implemented, forest cover this decreases in both in the treatment and in the control cells. But for the treatment cells, the forest cover loss was smaller. Uh, on the right, you have the evolution of the difference between these uh, two curves, and which is the conservation effect. And we see that the impact increases with time, but also that uncertainty in the measurement gets bigger. And for this specific area in, any, in each case, and we can make um, then uh, such analysis for each uh, area of interest. Next slide, please. So summarizing the results on the 15 protected areas suggest that on average, and on total terms, protected areas help to decrease or avoid forest cover loss, and that the effects are larger in the long, long term. So in the graph, you can see results uh, for five and uh, 10 years after the program implementation. But individually, and there are some areas where forest cover loss doesn't change, or even for, for one specific uh, area increased. And so, to conclude, further analysis and work should be conducted to increase the sample of, uh, and to assess the heterogeneity and the mechanism of these impacts. And of course, and we should keep in mind that these analyses are useful to have a first quantified assessment of the impact, but parameters like management quality and biodiversity and local development should affect the results. And, but are difficult to measure. And to better understand the mechanism of effectiveness or non-effectiveness and take into account local specificities, it's necessary to conduct deeper analysis and to communicate with uh, different uh, stakeholders on conservation. And I let uh, the conclusion remarks for Melvin. Thank you. So yes, we have this analysis, but so what do we do with this one? Um, this, this analysis for us is a tool, and this tool has different uh, purposes. So for once, it's, uh, for one, it's, it's a tool to convince policymakers so that they can gain confidence in conservation-based area investment. Um, so we, for example, I actually um, went to the COP15 with this one pager that we created. Um, and uh, we did um, talk with people um, and um, show them about um, the positive effects conservation-based area can have, doesn't necessarily have to be, but can have actually. Um, and it's worthwhile to, to pursue the protection of biodiversity on our planet. Um, it's a tool to, um, to learn, to improve development projects, hence also then to plan further conservation projects, and then to stir this dialogue um, on conservation itself, right? Um, what we do is, in, um, we use this MapMe platform to get all the data, and, and also the code that we developed, we also uploaded it there, so people can use it. Um, we, um, we, because we are in the evaluation department, we are gonna write a working paper, which is still ongoing actually, we're not done yet. Um, and um, the other thing that we do is 
we write evaluation reports for the specific projects. For each of these projects, uh, we, uh, what we will do in the future, and we have been, started this year, is uh, to go through the whole cycle of the analysis, to download the data, to do the matching, to make the comparison of the statistical significance, and then to estimate the coefficient, finally to write the report so people can read and learn as well. Right? Um, I hope this was interesting to you. And um, if you have any further questions uh, later at the session, Ingrid and I will be happy to share. Thanks a lot. Thank, Thank you, you very much. Great. Thanks a lot, Melvin and uh, Ingrid. It's actually great to, to see the collaboration between AFD and KFW going forward. Uh, this great work you guys are doing. I remember when I was actually involved in this a few years back when I was working under Claire Zanuzo here present today. So it's really great to see that this is moving forward and, and that you guys are collaborating on, on those uh, very interesting topics in terms of impact evaluation. So um, let's quickly move forward uh, with the next presentation of uh, Anupa Manans, uh, which is basically going to focus on climate interventions. So Anupam is a senior evaluation officer um, in the independent evaluation office of the GEF, the GEF being the global environment uh, facility. So over to you, Anupam. Thank you, Alex. Uh, and before I begin, I would like to thank IG for hosting this event, and particularly Estelle and Virginia. So as most of you already know, what is Jeff? So Jeff is the uh, financial mechanism for uh, five major uh, UN environmental conventions. So we primarily work in these thematic areas but they do not uh, play on the ground independently. So there's a lot of uh, fusion between these multiple uh, focal areas, as we, as we call. So the point here is that we need a lot of evidence. In the evaluation office, we are looking for evidence. Uh, we're looking for accountability of the Jeff grants. And also, we're looking to learn from the Jeff uh, interventions. So we need a lot of evidence, and that's where remote sensing and, and GIS uh, comes very handy. So many of the indicators uh, proposed by the multilateral environmental agreements, for instance here, uh, the UNCCC, and also many of the SDGs indicators are remotely sensible, and no pun intended here. And, and there are studies that have mapped uh, certain indicators with remote sensing uh, uh, technology and remote sensing uh, indices. And it's far more important for Jeff to leverage uh, remote sensing and GIS because majority of our projects are in isolated, uh, fragile, and conflict environments. So uh, due to lack of time, I'll be giving you a kind of a whistle uh, stop tour. So this is an example from uh, uh, a project in, in Colombia, and this is Choco region there, and it's a, it's, a, it's a conflict area when we visited, and uh, a lot of environmental degradation is happening here, and the only way to get to this site was uh, through a, a day-long boat ride. Uh, and while we were here, uh, there was some security situation, and we were evacuated uh, from this area. Then we visited another site, and this was already discussed and agreed upon. But the moment we reached there, within five minutes, we were asked to leave the site. So thankfully, I had a drone, and I was able to take it to a safe distance and, and, and look at the extent of degradation due to uh, illegal gold mining. So this doesn't only give you a visual evidence, but what, what these kind of tools does is uh, Fortunately, the animation is not working, otherwise I would have given you a fly, uh, fly away uh, of, the, of the region. Uh, but, the, but you can already see that in the snapshot. This is how it looks like uh, on the ground. So this data uh, collected from, uh, from drone fed into an algorithm that helped us quantify 
the extent of mining. So now conflict is not the only problem. And uh, here, cloud is another problem. But thankfully, we have radar data that can help us look through the clouds and, and look through uh, uh, night uh, as well. So using that data, we're able to quantify and we're look, able to look at the Jeff's impact in the areas uh, of intervention. So you can already see how useful it is uh, when you don't have baseline, when you cannot uh, reach to certain areas, and when you cannot have uh, uh, you visiting all the sites because it's, uh, uh, it's I would say, scale agnostic. It can work on your project site. You can work at a regional uh, uh, level, or you can also work at a global level. Now, it also gives you very interesting insights. And here, and this is a, a project site, actually, uh, and this is implemented by World Bank currently. So you can see here that uh, it's, the, it's, it's actually peace, uh, paradoxical as, as it may sound. It's the peace that, has, that brings uh, deforestation. And this was what uh, one of the uh, you know, project participant uh, told us. And, and looking at the data, you can clearly see that when you are in negotiation and, and post-conflict, the floodgates are open and everything is up for grabs. Uh, or for grabs sorry. Uh, so this is what we see in this data. That means we need more environmental action uh, in, in post-conflict situation. And we need to look at the entire conflict cycle. And that was one of our recommendations for Jeff. Uh, and uh, uh, in the evaluation of uh, Jeff's support in fragile and conflict areas. Now, during COVID, everything became fragile. And one of a major component of a big flagship Jeff program was on nature-based tourism. And that's where IFC was also involved. So we're talking about green tourism and ecotourism in Africa. And what we saw, this is an analysis of 8,000 protected areas. And Alex pointed out to the nighttime light data that is uh, uh, correlated with the GDP. And we saw that the economic activities were down in 75% of the protected areas across Africa. And why 75%? Because there were some areas where people didn't go anywhere. Think of. Uh, you know, DRC or Sierra Leone or those kind of areas. But I'm talking about Maasai Mara, I'm, uh, so you can, that you can see here. I'm talking about Serengeti. I'm talking about Kruger National Park. So all these saw a decrease in the night light intensity, and that means uh, a decrease in economic activities because of the lockdown. And this was also uh, verified by the location data coming out of our cell phones. And Google and other companies had made it available during the COVID. So we're able to verify with that. We also made some calls to all the big resorts and asked them about their uh, occupancy. And it was almost nil or like 1% or 2%. And most of the time, they were the staff who were residing there. So what's the implication for the evaluation? So this fed into our MR, and we recommended not to put all the eggs in one basket. So diversify the livelihood op option. And in the next phase, that has been considered. So it's much more wider in terms of uh, uh, the, the livelihood uh, options. Also, not only were we able to look at the relevance or, or the effectiveness or the impact. We are also able to look beyond the timeline. So this is an interesting uh, project that we, that we collaborated with NASA. And here you can see not only how much carbon is being sequestered over a period of time, you can also see the prediction for 2020. This was in 2017. So 2020, we're talking about Aichi targets. 2030, we're talking about uh, SDG. And uh, if you can see the signage, actually, when they put the signage on the ground, there were no forests. So it was really good to search for this signage and find it amidst uh, a dense forest. Uh, and you can also see the recovery pattern in the Mount Kenya National Park. Uh, and so it can also help us understand whether the targets being set by the projects are realistic or not. Now, the way it works best is 
within a mixed method framework. So at the Jeff IO, we have mainstreamed geospatial evaluations with all the relevant evaluations. And we use multiple types of data and methods, leveraging on remote sensing, leveraging on uh, GIS analysis. Also, I would like to amplify what Sabin said in the earlier session, and that was about the beneficiaries. And we believe that the best remote sensing analysis is grounds up and not from the sky. So the interpretation is always going to come from the subject matter expert, the evaluators who understand the context. Now, another advantage of using remote, remote sensing data is to, uh, within this mixed method framework, is to be able to tell what is affecting your outcome. So this is an interesting example of using a machine learning so, and uh, algorithm. So this is a regression tree, but uh, we found similar results with random forest. But the point here is that, okay, you have an increase in vegetation productivity. What are the factors uh, associated with it? So here we saw, very interesting, uh, that the first finding in, in, uh, and first very interesting finding is that it takes around five years uh, to see the impact after the projects have closed. And think about your ICR uh, timeline or the project closer timeline. You're not able to capture the maximum impact. And any gardener will tell you, if you plant a tree, unless it's a bamboo, and that's a grass actually. So it will take you five years, I mean, at least to see any signal. So that's very important. We need to rethink our results framework. Also access to electricity. I think Masha in her presentation mentioned uh, about the pumps uh, being so uh, uh, effective in, in, in uh, yield uh, increase. So similarly here also we saw that if there's an irrigation uh, and uh, we, we have a lot of World Bank studies that have uh, pointed out that access to electricity means access to irrigation, access to education. Uh, so it has uh, a lot of cascading effects. So, but it's, it's, it's very beautiful to see that from empirical evidence uh, standpoint. And, and then there are other uh, factors. So this is what a GIS analysis or a remote sensing analysis in a mixed uh, method framework uh, can help us do that. So these evaluations have had effect on the Jeff policy, on the Jeff uh, strategy, and, and, and Jeff practice, uh, because they were able to help us provide very robust and objective evidence. So you can put a map, like your finger on the map, and there's no denying, right? But it has also instilled the spatial thinking. And, and if I have one take away from uh, this session, I would, I, would, I would say it's the special thinking because it's embedded everywhere and a space is so important. And, and, and so what has happened apart from those uh, other uh, influence, it has also helped increase the special thinking within our organization. So now due to our recommendation, a special, the location data uh, collection and reporting has become a requirement. I mean, we have a long way to go. We still don't understand the difference between accuracy and, and, and precision and, and things like that. But when I joined in uh, at the Jeff and we did a quick study, we found that only 5% of the projects had precise geographical location. But now that's had changed. Now, it's a requirement and, and the data is being collected. Also, there's more special targeting in the Jeff programming. So you have Amazon Biome, you have Congo Basin, you have Indo, uh, Malay, uh, Forest Biome. So there's more uh, special targeting. Also, if you look at the indicator framework, uh, they have become more special. Uh, also, there are more special platforms being developed uh, within uh, the Jeff and also by the Jeff uh, agencies. Now, based on our experience, I would just like to summarize a few uh, uh, lessons for us, and that is a partnership is the key. We don't have to reinvent the wheel. And also, this has budgetary 
uh, implication. If you try to do everything, this will take more time, this will take more resources. So it's really good to join forces. So we have joined forces with NASA, we have joined forces with William and Mary, we have joined forces with University of Maryland, uh, where I come from, uh, actually. And then also, there is no silver bullet. I mean, this goes for any method. So no method is a silver bullet. It's not going to solve all your evaluation questions. But this works really well in, in mixed method uh, framework to complement and sometimes to, uh, to supplement uh, uh, the evidence we are gathering. Uh, also, like any data and method, we have to be careful. And, and, and we have to pay due diligence about the data risk and ethical consideration, more so because a special is special. You are revealing the location, so you have to be very, uh, uh, very diligent about uh, using special data. Also, some areas have more data than the others. So some areas, as we call jokingly, are on data holiday. So when we're talking about the, uh, the global south, uh, they are not as rich in, in terms of uh, special uh, data. Uh, so we also have to make sure that we don't leave those uh, uh, behind. And then I'll like to go back to a class point on continuous learning. And so every day there's a new GPT, there's a new satellite, there's a new algorithm. And for us as an evaluator, we have to take evaluation as a dynamic learning process and keep ourselves updated. With that, here are a few resources. If you're interested, these are all freely available on our website. And uh, with that, I would like to thank you for your attention. Thank you very much, Anupam. Great presentation. I, I very much stand by your argument on partnerships and mixed methods. I think that goes a very long way. So. Uh, now we'll have a Q&A uh, section, so we're welcoming basically any questions or comments on, on the different presentations that were made during the session. Um, should we open to the audience? Yeah, absolutely. Priority to the audience. And Melvin and uh, everybody who was online is still there. It's, it's also late for you at this stage. We're <coughs> getting late in Europe also. But is everybody still there? G? Yeah, okay. Yes. Great. Yes, you are there. Thank you. Thank you for staying up. Um, yeah, any question in the room? And okay, I see Sabine. Go ahead. So we've heard great examples of when it works. And could you give us example when it doesn't work? Uh, I'm very interested in those failed attempts that you had that uh, can tell us a lot. Great. Uh, Alex, we take, we take several. Okay. Uh, should I direct? Do you direct? Okay. Okay. Uh, I had seen. Yes, Avina. Um, okay. S I have um, two two questions. It's reasonable. You can. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, Alex. Um, hi, Alex. Hi. Um, we. I was curious about the. Uh, kind of the live monitoring model in Pakistan. Um, um, could you, it seemed like a, in, you know, it's a very data intense model for, you know, monitoring small infrastructure. Could you just go into like, you know, was this a massive amount of different projects that prompted this tool? Um, and could you give an example of, of how it was used for monitoring? Like, was there you know communication with local stakeholders that followed up if something wasn't moving forward, or like you know was there capacity on the other side to to receive and use this data in a similar way as as you know the tool is you know updated live? But was there also you know, a utility on the other side. That's, that's, that's my question on that. It's like, was it used for decision-making? Um, and on the land, land use there also on that model, was the land use monitoring in specific connection to the, 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 the investments, or was it also to look at the, how land use around the project was influenced, like some sort of co-benefit or, or impact of, of the projects? So that, that's my question for Alex. Let me also do my question for, I think... Uh, that's three. But oh, yes. I'm sorry. You know, go my ahead. <laughs> <laughs> for uh, 
let's see, uh, Ma- Masha, right? Yes, Masha. Masha yes. Um, so there is, you know, there's been a lot of research on the relationship between irrigation and agricultural productivity, right? Like we we know that there's a positive relationship there. So I was curious to see, was there any reason to suspect that that wouldn't have a positive impact on agricultural productivity? Was the uh, and did you find that in some cases that uh, irrigation did not lead to agricultural productivity and was that somehow, you know, in a finding that could be used to see, you know, is there some issue with this irrigation uh, system in a specific place? Or, you know, I'm just curious at that angle, because you mentioned that that was your imp- most important variable, and I agree, but we know, I mean, that that will have a positive impact. So so I'm, I'm just curious as to, to, to the thinking there, a little de- devil advocate's question, I guess. But yeah, thank you so much. Super interesting. Um, and it's so fun to see so many familiar faces as well. Thank you. Um, yeah, so maybe the first question was for you, Anupa. So the failed attempts, do you have some failed attempts to share or anyone? No, thank you for that question. I think this is very, very important question. Uh, so I'll say long back, I met a novel laureate in a train uh, and Eric, uh, so, uh, and I, I had met him for the second time, and uh, uh, so here in the metro, and I asked, I saw, I saw him, and I just followed, and I got a seat next to him, and I asked them that, okay, how come you're able to like show a complete new set of work in a year's time? And he said, Anupam, you don't say, uh, you don't see the areas or the experiments that I have failed in. So similarly, what you see here uh, was the best use case uh, example, uh, but during COVID. We were uh, trying to look at certain uh, changes uh, in, say, forest fire intensity because, you know, these protected areas are managed, and if there are no management, uh, then uh, there's a nature paper that said that uh, the the number of fire incidents uh, in Madagascar uh, increased because of, uh, you know, government officials being deployed on some other task. Now we thought we could replicate uh, those kind of studies, um, and and same with the forest change without realizing. So we did this uh, analysis, and it takes a lot of effort and time uh, and and failures to get there. And suddenly we realized that we don't see any signal, and that. That's when we started thinking, why it's not happening? And then we realized that there is actually a lag time. So things don't fall immediately after you have a conflict. Uh, in a disaster, it's different. Because people are resilient to different extent. And, and, and so we realized that when there's a human uh, case in there, uh, then it takes time. But the remote sensing analysis was uh, only yielded I would say 40% of what we had expected it to yield. But we have a very uh, conducive environment in, in trying to, f- where we are encouraged to fail and we are encouraged to learn from those failures. Uh, so I won't call it a failure, but I would say this was more like failing forward as uh, President Banga says. So, uh, so we learn from failures, failures are good. And we, we failed uh, a lot many times uh, but we kept on investing uh, in, in uh, remote sensing infrastructure and, and the ecosystem. And that yielded us benefits during COVID when everyone was looking for different methods and different tools trying to figure out. We, we already had a treasure trove of uh, uh, information and, and framework to follow. And, and that's why we were more resilient. Uh, so. I hope that answers your question, that we do fail. Especially when it comes to innovation, uh, failure is imperative. Thanks, Anupa. Alex, you want to take yeah. Alvina's question? Yes. Um, actually, I, I would like to try and get back the video, which we're trying to fix right now, in, in order to answer your question in the meantime. So I don't know if, Masha, you want to first take your question while I bring up the video. Sure, sure, thank you. Um, so I'll take the question on um, why did we do the study, even though um, we could have expected positive effects on irrigation uh, or from irrigation. Um, this has to do also with Deval's special role. We don't just do research, but we need to, um, you know, provide evidence that 
whatever works somewhere else maybe also works for German Development Corporation. But I think this is not the most important point why we did this. I think what was um, why it was worthwhile doing this, why it was worthwhile doing this study was because we were able to leverage really long data and like time series, which often you are unable to do. So um, when we started off, we felt like there was not enough evidence out there of, of looking at that, that would tell us how long these effects would actually last for. Because we were able to um, look at these um, projects for almost 20 years. And then also another reason was that we did this in a conflict context and there was not much evidence yet from conflict context of the effects of irrigation. And we had doubts that we, we would be able to sort of transfer evidence from peaceful context to conflict context because there's several reasons why, um, you know, uh, the projects might not be as successful, but also why there might even be effects of these projects on the conflict itself. So that was another another. Um, Reason and then you also ask about did it ever not work and what did we find there? Um, I just checked the paper again uh, where Alex was um, um, giving his answers and yes, actually we found that there were two types of plots. So one was just uh, regular fields that were being irrigated, and the other plot type was very special to Mali, I think. Which uh, these these areas are called Mare in French, and I think the uh, English translation would be floodplains. And they were, these are areas that um, seasonally flood um, through uh, Niger River water. And basically what this project did was they just um, uh, controlled the water inflow more. And um, we did not see um, positive effects um, of, you know, valorizing, as they called it, those floodplains, um, but only from these sort of regular fields. And then another difference was that in uh, we didn't see um, the most powerful effects were in northern Mali, where near uh, where river water was used for irrigation, and it seemed like um, the areas in southern Mali in the Sikasso region were less successful. And we believe that this was because here um, there was a storage of rainwater, and then rainwater was used, and that. Um, this type of irrigation was less under control of the farmers than um, when those in the north using river water. And, and another reason might be that um, we learned that um, the farmers in the north, they actually had to contribute financially quite a bit, or not maybe not financially, but with their manpower to build up the infrastructure. So commitment and ownership was much better than in the south, where there was a different... Um, mechanism being implemented. So essentially, I think that farmers using the infrastructure in the south of Mali, they were less um, implemented. They had le invested less time, essentially, in um, setting up the infrastructure and it was less well maintained. So this, these were some of the differences that we found. Thank you. Thank you. Are you ready, Alex? Yeah. Okay. Mm. Yeah. yeah, right now. Okay, perfect. It's connected, yeah. Okay. Fair enough. So yeah, uh, just to answer your, here we go. I think a video should be appearing any second now. No, that's not this screen. It's not as one. <laughs> So we should just wait? Yeah. Okay, I'll start in the meantime. Um, so eventually, um, eventually the, the, the answer to your question is the following. Um, you would only do this type of exercise for two reasons. Either there is one or few infrastructures that are in an unreachable uh, region of a certain country because there is conflict, or there is lots of small infrastructures spreaded around in, in different regions or different districts of a region, or the mix of both, which is what we faced in Pakistan, right? Because implementing this kind of system, um, as indeed as a certain cost, we're not talking about a multi-million exercise here. I, I think the implementation of this, um, this platform was probably around 50,000. Um, yeah. There you go. 
Yeah, so here you're, you're seeing it on the screen, essentially uh, moving. It, it just gives you an impression. You won't see much, but it gives you an impression of, of what's happening on the platform. You can overlay very, very high resolution satellite imagery. You can compare before uh, the construction and after the construction. Then you'll see that they will zoom in and zoom out. They will overlay some, some land use data. So th this is what the platform is about, essentially. So. The first thing that needs to happen if you want to do that is that you need to know where the, where the infrastructure is, right? And on this one and on many projects, what we try to do is to collaborate with the GEMS team. So uh, Bernard Metz is not, is not here anymore. He was here at the beginning of the session, but essentially that's the very first step. You need to know where the infrastructure is or it, where it's supposed to be. Once you have this information, then you can build this kind of infrastructure and, and, and do this kind of uh, different analysis that also overlay land use. The reality is that for this to still be affordable, because you want to, you know, you're taking advantage potentially uh, and plugging this into an um, m and &E budget that there is for the project, uh, you're building on as much open data as possible. This very high so the very high resolution satellite image you might have to procure, sometimes it's actually available through partnerships. Uh, the World Bank has a new partnership with Airbus. It's important to, to take note of this. Um, and, and so, Generally, the idea is not to, to build something that is overpowered, but to kind of build uh, these type of platforms that are fairly affordable, build on as much open data as possible. And it's more about pulling the data from gems, put it on there, then overlay the other uh, layers. Uh, when I say gems, it's the geolocated data collected through Kobo Toolbox put it on this platform and then overlay these other types of data and put functions that will allow you to aggregate and create those graphics, uh, which then will be used by the ministry. And so to answer your question about the use, this is being used right now by the ministry in Pakistan to see what's been happening, what which infrastructures are already being built, which ones are late, because they cannot afford, there is so many small infrastructures around the country that they cannot afford to send a team to check if each one has been built essentially, right? Um, so that's the reason they would do that in order to kind of monitor the construction of the infrastructures. And, and the last part of your question, I think, was on land use. So the reality is that if we tap into open data, uh, I don't really think we would even we would even pick up the change of land use linked to the infrastructure itself because it's so small. So it's definitely more about what's happening around, right? Is there urban expansion? Uh, we could even pick up if there is an increase in nighttime lights. Uh, is there deforestation potentially? This, this is the kind of things we can pick up. Um, and, and that's the whole point also of trying to understand potentially the socioeconomic or environmental impacts of the implementation of those uh, projects. So if you have any questions, of course, let me, let me know afterwards. Um, Harsh, I saw you. I also have a question, so I'm taking my privilege of, of having a mic to, to ask them. Um, uh, Melvin and, and Ingrid, I was, I mean, I was, really intrigued because we have a biodiversity evaluation coming up and uh, I have a big interest in trying to, to, do, uh, to, to help the team do good work there. Um, I have two questions for you. One is, um, so that was really interesting because you, you looked at the portfolio of activity, right? It wasn't just a, like one, one intervention in a particular place. Um, and so I was wondering if beyond trying to measure the average which you ended up doing for for the for the large portfolio kfw smaller portfolio for for ifd at this stage um are you also able to try to understand through a mixed methods or through another kind of configurational approach under what conditions it works uh, what were the factors that were driving that in in some protected areas it seemed to work better in other protected areas less so, and if that's the case, or if it's something you would like to do at uh, another time, could geo, uh, located geo, geospatial data also help us to kind of expand uh, the, the, our understanding of the, of the conditions under which it works? So that's my first question. My second question is, um, I, I'm really fascinated by the the partnership, right? You've been working on this. I mean, uh, I mean, side by side or together. Um, and I was wondering if you had any lessons on on you know some of the com compromises you had to do or some of the uh, variation in design you had to do so that it could work for for both of uh, of, of your institutions. Ingrid, I could answer the first one and you can answer the second one if you like to. Okay, so 
Thank you, Estelle. Um, the, the question of what works, what does not work is also really driving our interest because at the moment we just say um, on average it doesn't work um, or like for this particular um, particular area it does work for the other one it does not. Um, so we want to go this step further and what we, um, what we already did and what I did not show you um, is um, to to classify the projects into different action types. So there's this IUCN classification of uh, what needs to be done in a uh, particular area for it to be effective. And we use this classification to recode retrospectively um, the internal KFW reports on the exact measures so that we can classify what kind of activities have been performed. So this is not geospatial. It, it's based solely on internal project documentation. Um, so um, we have not completed this analysis yet. Um, and also we have some issues because some, because these kind of, it's not that you would do only one thing. Um, you would do multiple things in a protected area. And most of the time you do these packages at the same time often, right? So it's very hard to distinguish um, the different activities performed. Um, we're still working out a, uh, um, a solution. So far, we can see that management is effective and also um, the education of neighboring surroundings and neighboring communities is also very effective. Um, we still have to chisel out the exact statistics and coefficients, um, but that's one way. Go back into your internal project documentation, read them totally, and then do some coding. Um, so obviously this takes time. Um, and um, we, we took that, uh, but we think it's worthwhile to pursue and we can rec recommend that. And um, I head over to Ingrid for the second question. Thank you. And yes, about the partnership, um, I think that uh, this is a successful story and it started uh, very, very slow because uh, at the beginning we didn't have the, the, the resources. So no, we didn't have the, a person that can follow um, the, um, the methodology that uh, KFW implemented. But once we had that and we go very, very fast uh, to be almost uh, at the same level, at least uh, at the, at the, for the analysis, at the same level uh, and as the KFW. Um, and so for us, it's, it's very, it was very good because and something that they already prepared and, and took a lot of time and people and resources and to build for us it was uh, it was it a lower cost because we already and take their 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 codes and the idea also but once we started and we were able to do it right also we also collaborated and and i think uh, and we um, the, the Ingrid, we, we lost you, I think, the sound at least. Um, maybe, okay. Ingrid, I'm sorry, we lost you in terms of sound. What? Okay, hmm. maybe. Uh, uh, positive, sorry, yes. It's okay, Ingrid, we lost you for a second, but I think Claire is going to compliment what you were, you were saying. Okay. Thank you. Do you hear me? Okay. Thank you, Ingrid. Uh, just to complement on both questions. Uh, so on the first one, on the KFW side, uh, Melvin explained how you can do better with the current methodology for Latin America. Uh, on IFD side for the African portfolio, uh, what we are currently doing to to dig further into the government's question or the behavior of the population living in these protected areas um, is we are actually running some additional 
uh, ground surveys uh, to know more about the, to characterize more the governments, the governance yeah. aspect of uh, each protected area. So of course it cannot be done at the portfolio level. We are doing it on some um, large or significant uh, protected area. Uh, so we have three more impact evaluation ongoing, two in Madagascar uh, on several impact, um, protected areas, not just one. And, uh, and the second one was the, f the second Congo Basin uh, impact evaluation I, I show you this morning. Uh, so that the only way from our side uh, to, to go deeper into this question of uh, impact or heterogeneity of impact depending on governments or population behavior, which is very important for us to know how it could would work better and have um, the learning loop into the next generation of intervention in terms of protected area. Um, and we can, so far we cannot do what Melvin suggested for KFW because as you uh, as Ing hit uh, highlight, in our case, it's very difficult to have uh, the complete overview of our protected area portfolio. So in terms of what doesn't work uh, for this kind of portfolio evaluation uh, to be able to be implemented, you need to know where are the protected areas you support. And it seems obvious, but I mean, this is an example where it just works partially if you don't have a perfect geolocalization of your intervention. And on the second question for the partnership, uh, so maybe it was not um, that clear, but it's not a joint analysis. We use the same methodology applied to us. So no, we don't downscale or do an adaptation uh, to be adapted to both portfolio. Uh, we just learn, so KFW started, uh, thank you. Melvin and your team, uh, and then we are doing the same, and then we build on each other on what we learn. And uh, I agree with both of them. It's a very successful partnership, and we go faster and learn a lot, not being alone working on the challenges we face step by step. Great. I think we should... Uh Close, yeah. Uh, I mean, close for n now, and take maybe a two-minute stretch break. Um, say goodbye to Ingrid, Melvin, Marsha. Thank you so much for staying up, um, and uh, and thank, thank you. you very much for your interventions. Yeah. Thanks for having us. Thank you. Appreciate it. Have a yeah. good day. So I imagine we're a bit sleepy. We we s we still have two presentations, and so I would invite you to just stretch, stand. Um, perhaps go get some water, I don't know what's left outside, perhaps a little bit of coffee, and then within two or three minutes, we, we come back in. Okay, thank you. <laughs>